Hey, what's going on? And welcome back to the Rockman Power Hour, a podcast where we talk to the most interesting people in the world of pop culture. And this week on the show, we have got the lead singer of the band Buck Cherry, Mr. Josh Todd. want to bring in my co-host ryan stick ryan what's going on my man rocking shirts talking in mics thinking about hot Hot sauce sauce. you got it all down you got all the 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 important basics of the podcast um heartbeat hot sauce the heartbeat of the rockman power hour want to give them a big shout out for sponsoring us uh they are truly the uh the company that helps us keep the lights on and we're so proud to be supporting them because they really really do have an incredible product if you've never tried heartbeat hot sauce try them out you will not be disappointed and use our promo code rockman20 right below and that'll give you 20 percent off your entire order and you can use that over and over again trust me go to heartbeathotsauce.com put yourself together a nice six pack of hot sauce and they've got everything from mild to i will die if i have another drop of this so if you're a hot sauce enthusiast you will definitely find what you need at heartbeathotsauce.com if you like something tastier like living on a dare heartbeat hot sauce is for you Ooh, did you write that yourself uh yes this second (laughs) very very good (laughs) uh also a big thanks to studio house designs for keeping us looking fresh ryan's got the scream shirt on i missed that one and that's okay because that happens sometimes but when you're not quick on the draw when studio house designs does a drop and they do that quite often usually a couple of times a month um i am waiting with bated breath for my new midsummer stuff um they've got some great stuff and they're always doing incredible incredible stuff great graphic designers and um great t-shirt company out of philadelphia so go check them out at studiohousedesigns.com i'm rocking the casper this is always a sore spot so i don't want to rock it too much because ryan i don't know this brings up weird emotions in you when i wear the casper shirt that's why that's why i've been wearing it so much well you know i stretched mine because i'm fat and stinky and that is and that is an inside joke for everybody who understands the movie Casper. Exactly. Those are the, those are the names of all the uncles. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to our guest right now. Josh Todd, lead singer of the band Buck Cherry. Now, Ryan, um, I, I love the fact that we got to have Josh on the podcast. He's been kind of like this mythical figure in my journey in music because I never got to actually meet him and talk to him, but I would always see him around L.A. I remember going to a Mm. show and there would be Josh Todd from Buck Cherry. And it was always like, because he was a rock star at a time when you weren't a rock star. If you were in a band, you were, um, you know, especially when, and we talk about it in the interview in, in 99, um, when they dropped their first record, this was all about new metal. It was about rap rock. It was about being aggressive and screaming. And and then you have this guy that looks like he got off, he steps off the Aerosmith tour bus and he's, and he's singing about, you know, partying and cocaine. And you're like, who is this band? And they were just so <laughs> fucking cool. So I remember the the only time I ever really saw Josh um, up close was two times. Well, I saw them live in Detroit. Uh, we were playing this place called St. Andrew's Hall. And I believe we played the smaller room and they played upstairs. And it was happened to be the same night. So I went up and saw the band. And then they were practicing in a place in Studio City uh, at a practice spot. And we were practicing there as well. And I remember I saw him come out to have a cigarette and I was like, Oh, there's Josh Todd. And it was like kind of cool. So it was nice to be able to chat with him. Um, what I found out while we were chatting is he's a fellow sober guy. And as you know, I've got, um, Mm. you know, I've got quite a bit of sobriety and, and he does as well. So we were able to get the actual story of lit up, which is my favorite Buck Cherry song. And, and, you know, how the song came about and what it's really about and, um, and everything in between. So, so the new Buck Cherry album is called volume 10 and it is out now on round Hill records. Go check it out. Um, it's a great record and I'm really, really grateful that we got a chance to catch up with Josh Todd. So check it out right here. Our conversation with Josh Todd of Buck Cherry. All right, really, really happy to uh, be joined today on the podcast uh, with a singer of a band that I've um, that I've admired from afar for a long, long time. Just because when this band came out, they were against the grain of everything else that was going on in 1999. And I'm really, really happy to be joined by Josh Todd of the band Buck Cherry. Um, Thanks. See, you you have a, a visitor with us, or you have a friend that's that's sitting in. <laughs> yeah, this is Lion. He's a uh, he's he's our dog. He's awesome. 
He's yeah. uh, two years old. Amazing kid. Uh, King Charles, King Charles Cavalier. They're great nice. dogs. Beautiful dog. Um, Thank you. Th- there's something about animals that um, I, I, you know, when you know someone's a dog lover, you know that they've got a side to them that is just a little yeah. bit different than everybody else. And you know, there's like there's someone might have a, a like a rough exterior, but as soon as you see the way they are with their dogs, it's a it's a whole different ball game. Yeah, yeah. Animals, period, are amazing. Yeah, we love them. They really are. Um, I would like to spend time with animals probably more than I do with humans, but. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're here to talk about the new record, Volume 10. Uh, it's coming out June 2nd. Um, and, you know, we, we we spoke briefly before before we jumped on here and started recording. Uh, I, I lived in California in 1999. And in 99, it was all about new metal. It was all yep. about, you know, corn, Limp Bizkit, Deftones. And I remember yes. you guys stood out like a sore thumb, but you guys were so, I mean, you worked with producers that had worked, you know, you worked with Terry who had worked with all those bands. But when you guys came out, there was just something different about you guys. Um, you guys were just rock and roll. Uh, what was it like yeah. for you to try to navigate the waters in that time, putting out a record in 99? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was interesting. You know, we've, we've kind of been on our own Island since 99. I mean, we, right. it's rock and roll has still never been mainstream since we started, you know, it's, it's so bizarre to me, Yeah, but um we just, uh, you know, I grew up in Orange County, California, you know, like, um, all, all my foundation is like independent punk rock records and, you know, so I never thought anything else of making, you know, just rock music, you know, just straight up rock and roll, you know, with, uh, bass, guitar, vocals, drums, you know, I was always in four piece bands uh, up until Buck Cherry. So, right. um, yeah, you know, uh, it was always, always about uh the song and about performing and and that was it you know didn't think anything else of it and then here we drop a record and it's in the middle of what you were saying a big uh rap rock movement you know yeah. um and and uh like those kind of that kind of nerd rock that was going on with the buddy holly glasses and everybody's looking at the shoes and <laughs> you know so uh we come out there and and here I am doing my thing. And, you know, a lot of people didn't get it, you know, but um, the ones that did, it was uh, pretty, pretty cool. And we created like a little buzz in L.A. and then we got a record deal, you know. Um, and, you know, that first record, um, it, it really it's holds a special place in my heart because, you know, when I heard the song lit up, uh, it was, I don't know. It was just, there's, first of all, it was an anthem, you know, uh, obviously, you know, it was one of those crap, you know, rock songs that was really, really well crafted because you've got this song that just sounds like this fun party song, but it's got a really, really dark side to it. And, and I love music like that. I like when somebody gives me something that has like a bit of a double entendre, you know, a, a double meaning, um, an, a band that I really like who does that is Steely Dan. You know, you'll listen to Steely Dan and you'll be like, Oh, yeah, Steely right. Dan says happy, you know, and like, no man, there's some dark shit going on in the lyrics. So, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of dark shit. Right. So that's what I, what, what I, what I caught right away when I, when I heard lit up, I was like, man, this is fucking like no holds barred. Like this is what it's like to do Coke. And, and I thought it was just, yeah. it was, it was incredible. And now knowing that you're sober. Um, yeah. you know, I just think it's, I, it's just funny how, how these things, sometimes you, you think something's is, is direct and as obvious and it's on the nose as you, as you might perceive it to be, but it's not. Yeah. You know, wrote that song very quickly, probably 15 minutes. You know, I walked yeah, into yeah. rehearsal one day and they were, they were playing the song in the rehearsal room and I'm like, this is great. And I just got on the microphone and started scatting out a melody. And I'm like, this gotta be a party song in my head. That's what I'm telling myself. And then I just, ripped it out, wrote it out. And, uh, just wanted to write about the first time I did cocaine because I, I went to high school in, uh, uh, Mission Viejo, California called Tribuco Hills. Okay. Uh, and it was a newly, it was a new high school at the time. So we were the first graduating class. So it was kind of under construction the whole time and very small, uh, compared to what it is now. But, um, my point is, uh, one of the one of the guys in that school graduated ahead of us and got an apartment uh, or got an uh, yeah an apartment right across the street there were some apartment buildings and he started dealing coke and he would have like these parties and it seemed like everybody at the school had coke you know yeah. like the the jocks the the metalheads the punk rockers the surfers everybody had cocaine you know because this guy was supplying the whole school Anyways, um, I went to one of his parties one time and that, that was where the, that was the first time I did it. And it was just kind of a, 
uh, fun time of my life, you know, uh, it was just, um, that's when it was all working, uh, yeah. drugs and alcohol, you know, for me. Yeah. And I was having a blast with it. And, and that's, that's what the song's about. And it's crazy how that song's endured. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's, you know, obviously Crazy Bitch came after, but for me, it's always going to be about that song. That was the first introduction to me. And I was like, who the fuck are these guys? And I want to get yeah. on board. I want to get on board this. Um, so you got the new record. Uh, I listened to it about four times today just to really, really get my head in it. What I love mm -hmm. is that fact that, you know, like most of your records, there's choruses that jump out at you and you, you can hear a yeah. song once and you're already singing along. Um, yeah, that's great. How, how important is that to you? Like, you know, I'm listening to Good Time. I'm listening to Turn It On. And the choruses are like, I'm, I'm singing them by the end. You know, by the time I'm hearing them, maybe the second yeah. time, I, I know them. Um, that's Is that an important exercise for you guys in songwriting? Of course, yeah. It takes it takes a lot of practice to get to that place where you can write songs. Uh, you know, not just songs, you know, complete arrangements where <clears throat> you hear it once and it resonates with you and you can... And you want to go back and hear it again, you know, that's what good songs are all about, you know, and uh, volume 10 is an incredible record from beginning to end, you know, and what we want to do is just make 10 song records that you can put on and leave on, you know, that's, that's the, yeah. that's the goal. And uh, it started, you know, uh, Hellbound was a really great record. And, you know, this record is just right up there with it. And um, we're really excited, you know, uh, very grateful to be doing this after 24 years and, and uh, everything's going well. And I think the, um, you know, the fact that you guys are able to, to, to write a song like feels like love, like not, you know, a lot of bands can write bangers, but to write a ballad and write something that's even in that, that realm, uh, there's a reason why not many people were really good at it. You know, I, if yeah. I can think of a, there's a handful of bands I can think of that were able to write a good ballad. Um, you know, obviously Aerosmith being one of them, Def Leppard being one of them, and you guys are able to do it, man. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple on this record that are, and it's nice because you have an ebb and flow. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a bounciness to this record where you can get like that, but then you can write a song like, like feels like love and, and it's not cheesy. It's, it's actually, you know, it, it's authentic. That's a tough dance. Thanks. Yeah. You know, um, all of my favorite rock records had, had mid tempo songs, rockers yeah. and ballads, you know, and I think that's a, that's a, a good rock record, you know, because I only, I don't, I don't have just one emotion. I, I don't want to be just one speed all the time, you know? Sure. So, yeah. um, yeah. And feels like love. We modeled, uh, Def Leppard's hysteria. That's exactly oh, what we did. I, okay, I was, I was go. really, uh, <laughs> I was really obsessed with hysteria for a long time. I thought, I think it's just like a perfect song. And, yeah. and to me, it's not even a ballad. It's one of those kind of like driving songs, you know, it's, yeah. it's got that kind of mid tempo, just thumping, uh, hypnotic beat. And that's what I wanted. And, uh, I said to Marty and Stevie, I said, I want them, I want uh, Buck Cherry's Hysteria. And then I left the studio and they, uh, they uh, hit me with that later on that night. And I just took a couple hours and wrote the lyrics to it. You know, it's, it's really cool tune. Is that still the best feeling for you? That when that comes together? I mean, for, yes, even, yes. I even mean, more than playing live. It, I like every aspect of, of the game, you know, yeah. um, but one thing that's really fulfilling is um, creating something from nothing, you know, yeah. like I, I call it like record making, like building a house, you know, yeah. you, um, you know, and I love to start out with a clean slate, like not looking back on any like past songs that may have not made records or any of that. We just, we always start fresh because, you know, constantly growing as a human being and a musician. And, and so I want to kind of capture everything as far as where I'm here now in my life. And same with Stevie and Marty. And, um, and we just have this uh, mutual understanding that we're going to do what's best for the song. And we're going to get there no matter what, you know, and because of it, we have a, a great chemistry going, you know, and it's, it's working out well. The, um, the cover at the end, I mean, being a Canadian and being, uh, you know, someone who, who my, my other job is I'm a radio host at, at Showman Montreal. I mean, listen, he's our, he's our, he's our guy. Brian Adams is our guy. And when Amazing. I saw the edit cover of summer 69, I thought it was great. Um, it's, it's, it's a daring cover to do maybe not outside of Canada because, you know, to, to, to the rest of the world, but like, that's like, I guess in Canada, that would be kind of like, almost like covering, I don't know something. You know what I mean? It's like it's like it's it's one of those songs. Where like, all right, man. It's like doing a tra it'd be like it would be like doing a tra tragically hip song, you know. So it's a bit of right. a holy grail. So, but you guys did right. it justice. What what brought you yeah. to wanting to do a Brian Adams song? 
I mean, I, I say this all the time There's, you know, I think musicians always have songs that they wish they would have written, you know, and that's one of the songs, you know, um, yeah, that goes back to, you know, high school for me. And it kind of, it kind of, uh, you know, when I listen to that song, it reminds me of summer, you know, yeah. that, that song is summertime for me, you know, um, and all the things that go on, you know, having a band, guys leaving the band, yeah, yeah. you know, having the girl, everything that, you know, you're thinking that you're going to be with this girl forever, you know, and I had that girl. I had a, I had a girl that I was with for three years in, in high school and she was the love of my life, you know? So all those things, you know, um, it, it's, it just, uh, it hits me. It hits real, real deep in my heart when I hear that song. And, um, and so anyways, the, the reason it all came about is, uh, we would throw it out and play it live occasionally. And, and our manager caught it one night and he's like, Oh my God, you guys got to record this song. It's amazing. You know, and uh, Larry Mazer, our manager, and he kept on it and on it. We were like, okay, we'll, we'll do it sometime. That'd be fun. You know, and, and didn't think much of it. And then we, uh, at the end he kept pressing. And so it was the last song that we re recorded and we speed it up just a hair and put our, put our flavor on it. And, all of a sudden, it sounds like a Buck Cherry song, you know, a good Buck Cherry song. Well, and, uh, that that's the crazy know. that's the crazy thing. It's like it's not far outside of what you do. It, it falls right in line with with the spirit of your band. So it it's uh, it makes sense. Yeah, but I love the fact that uh, there's a good Canadian rocker that that touched you that way because it's uh, you know, again, growing up in in Montreal, I mean. Uh, Brian, Brian Adams, you know, it's like, it's, I mean, there was, there's so many Brian Adams songs. I mean, he had a run there that he just couldn't write a bad song. There were I so know. many great ones, but, um, that one in particular is really cool. And hopefully he'll hear it sometime and like, well, that's, it, you what, know, that's um, what I was going to say. Are you hoping to, that it gets to his ears one day? Obviously. Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> And I've always liked, I've always liked the last line. Um, you know, we'd always laugh about it. You know, me and my baby in a 69, is there a double, is there a double entendre in there? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on that. Everything too. about it is clever <laughs> and cool. And, you know, the thing with a, a well-written song like that is you can speed it up or slow it down and it's still great. You know? Yeah, and you and you could take anything away from it and just play it with a guitar and it, it, with an acoustic. I love the version, unplugged version he did where he slowed it down a little bit. It's yep. so amazing. Oh yeah, he's 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 pretty special, man. He's a, and and when you get to meet him, if you've ever if you've never gotten to meet him, he's a he's a good guy. He's and he's a he's he's a he's a storyteller, man. He knows how to. I want to meet him. That's yeah. great. Well, you will. This this happened. I mean, it's destiny. It's going to happen. Let's go. Um, speaking of meeting people, I, I don't know what I, maybe it was the fact that you kind of were on your own island, but it seemed like when Buck Cherry started, you guys were embraced by a lot of rockers, and they brought you out on the road. I mean, you guys went you went out with yeah. the who's who of rock and roll. Um, yes, we did. Tell me about the moment that blew you away the most, the guy or the girl or the person, you know, the, the musician that just, you were like, holy fuck, I'm standing in front of this person. All right. Or this person asked. Yeah. Yeah. There was a couple big moments. And the first one was, uh, you know, at the time we had a manager that uh, was also, his brother was managing Kiss, you know, Scott yeah. McGee was our manager and Doc McGee was managing oh, nice. Kiss. And, nice. and so we got the opportunity as a baby band on our first record this was right, right when Lit Up started to go in the States. We didn't know it. We had been, we had to go over uh, to Europe for the first time and play a month with Kiss, you know? And it was like, wow, you know, like we had never been to Europe. We had never uh, been on stage with an arena rock band. And so it was an amazing experience. And then the whole time Lit Up was gaining all this momentum on radio in the States. But anyways being in europe with kiss was so incredible and we just did the kiss cruise oh, and wow. we we saw a lot of people that had been at those first shows you know and and they were they're just such such awesome uh people and the kiss fans are great you know so anyways that was like uh one of the first incredible experiences and then on our second record time bomb we got to do like four shows at acdc and that was like rock and roll fantasy come true you know yeah. And then we got to meet them all um, uh, in their dressing room uh, on the last show at Madison Square Garden. And wow. like, it was incredible. They were just such, such humble people and uh, just, they were very open to us just talking about anything and hanging out. And I sat next to Angus and talked to him about everything. I'm like, I can't fucking believe this. And like... <laughs> You know, Angus's wife was just making us tea and we were just hanging out, you know, and Brian and, and uh, Brian Johnson was just 
telling jokes and everybody was cool. It was amazing, you know, and, and then also we played with Aerosmith yeah. on the millennium new year in Osaka, Japan. That was incredible. Oh my God. That's crazy. That's when everybody yeah. thought everything was at the strike of midnight. Everything yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that speaks volumes of what this band, you know, represented to a lot of rockers. I mean, I think the people that were in the know knew, you know, and, and I, and it's funny. Um, one of the bands that's getting a lot of heat now is Greta Van Fleet. Um, right. You know, Greta Van Fleet are a fucking amazing band. And anyone that wants to piss on them, I mean, you might say they sound like this, they sound like that, but at the end of the day, they've got chops. And and I think that's one yeah. of the reasons why the older rockers that are secure are grabbing them and taking them out. And it's all the younger guys that are like, well, fuck these guys. Yeah, well, it's because they're playing circles around you. Right. I, I don't know too much about them, honestly, um, but uh, more power to them. You know, we need good rock and roll acts out there. For sure. 100%. Um, so the new record dro drops June 2nd. Uh, I know there's some dates that have been announced. There's a spattering of dates, but is there like a full tour that's coming? Is there, is there stuff that's going to be getting announced soon? Uh, yeah, we've been, uh, we just did a whole leg with Skid Row. They put out a, a good record and, uh, they're still touring on that record. And we, yeah. we put out, we did a whole month with them and it was amazing. We sold out a lot of shows. So we're doing a leg two and a leg three with them. It's, and I, I leave, uh, I leave on Thursday for that. And um, then there's talk of a leg four, and we're coming up to Canada with the Skid Row package, uh, Skid yeah, Row Buck Cherry. Yeah, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, they got a, like I said, they had a new record they dropped not too long ago, and then we got um, volume 10, so it's working out good. Um, for you, obviously, you know, you're, you're a dog owner. Is, is it tough for you to leave for lengths of, lengths of time, or is it kind of like... Yeah, yeah, like uh, I have my wife and my kids send me uh, videos of yeah. Lion. Uh, just so, <laughs> and I got so many videos of him, you know, just little short ones of him, like chewing on something or doing something cute. And that really is, that really keeps me in check, you know, when I'm tired and just laying in my bunk in the bus, you know, I like to, it makes, it keeps me connected. Yeah. I, it, and it's funny after the pandemic, you know, the more rockers I talk to and guys in bands, especially, you know, close to our age, I'm, I'm 52, um, you know, leaving on tour, it's fun, it's work. But there's there's a part of you that just like we you know it's really nice to be at home and be connected and realize the moments that matter you know, um, yeah. but I think things like FaceTime, um, Zoom, all that makes it a lot easier to uh, to stay connected because you know before you couldn't do that at all you'd have to you'd have to hit a payphone, and you know even for <laughs> yeah. cell phones it was tough so yeah I guess that, that's gonna a, make it a bit easier. It's so much better for sure. I mean, uh, like you said, all those things have changed the whole game for us out here. You know, on the road. Um, dude, thank you so much for taking the time. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to connect with you. And, and again, um, you know, the minute I heard lit up, there was something about this band that was special and I, and I caught you guys, um, I think it was in St. Andrews hall in, in Detroit. We played, there was a smaller room downstairs and you guys were playing upstairs. And I remember going up and seeing you guys play and being just fucking blown away. You oh know? man. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, those were really good times back then. You know, Detroit is a, yeah, you know all all of Michigan is a huge um, audience for Buck Cherry. We've played yeah. all those places, Flint and, yeah, and Detroit, Detroit I and I Grand, going Grand Rapids, and yeah, you know yeah. a lot of great memories. I remember going to the machine shop and the guys were, were were raving about you guys. We got to play with Iggy Pop at the State Theater in Detroit. Whoa, what was that I like? I think that I think that's Detroit, right? State Theater. Uh, yeah, I think so. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was amazing. We played uh, on Halloween, and uh, he's he's like incredible, you know. I, he's another one that I heard is just the calmest dude. That is like <laughs> so. There's nothing about. There's no airs about him at all, right? He was nice. I, I went up in his dressing room, and he was you know doing his thing, and he looked you know like he is when he walked on stage. He just had pants on and no shirt. He was ready to go. You know. Dude, thanks for taking the time. Um, continued success. Record comes out June second, and uh, and all the best. And next, ho hope we get to talk to you again, man. Yeah, thank you, man. And I uh, can't wait to see everybody at the rock show. And, you know, when I see you, we'll hit a meeting or something if we have time. I'd love that. <laughs> All right. Big shout out to my friend Amber, who really helped out my uh, former band, Judgmental, when I was uh, in, from my teens into my you know late teens. I was in this band. And uh, I remember vividly Amber coming to town uh, to see Buck Cherry. 
and how she was raving about how excited she was to see them and stuff. So big shout out to Amber for that, because uh, she was the first person that made me turn my head about Buck Cherry and say, well, if Amber likes him, yeah. I got to give him a try. Oh, definitely. And when, when I put up the picture that, uh, that we had a chance to chat with, with, uh, with Josh, um, I got a message from my friend, uh, Frederic Savard and she's like freaking out. Cause she's such yeah, a, so, Fred. so people love Buck Cherry. Um, yeah. and, uh, and you know, she said, can you please ask him why he's not coming to Montreal? So, well, I didn't get a chance <laughs> to do that, but, but they are playing in Ottawa, uh, coming up and, uh, hopefully we'll get a Montreal date soon. So thank you so much to Josh Todd for being on the podcast. And, um, thanks to all of you for, for, for listening and for, for joining in and for subscribing. We recently hit our milestone of a thousand subscribers. So thank you so much for that, but let's not that let that end. Let's continue. No, let's get 2000, 3000. <laughs> let's just, because we live in a world where people value you only about how much attention you're getting, Yeah, which is weird though, because when I was growing up, if everybody liked something, I didn't you hated it. Right. You wanted <laughs> to, so, you wanted to find the thing that nobody was listening. I know, I know it is so hot. It's cold up is down yeah, everything's everything's different now yeah, everything's know. different yeah so uh but thank you so much for all of you for supporting we really appreciate it so uh, if you are listening and you're here for the first time we've got a lot of other episodes behind us so go dig into the catalog if you're listening on uh, a streaming service thank you for listening if you're watching us thank you for subscribing to youtube uh, and like subscribe let us know in the comments what you like what you don't like we're very open to criticism we love hearing from you we love feedback thank you to heartbeat hot sauce the heartbeat of the Rockford Power Hour. Thank you to Studio House Designs for uh, keeping us looking fresh. And, uh, you know, this uh, this still scares me, Ryan, when I see it right back there, Richard Patrick. And thank you to Pure Arts. What, what scares me is that uh, every Terminator has been around for 40 years and everybody's really jumping on this AI train. And I'm like, guys, this is how it starts. <laughs> I know, it starts I, know. With, I know. It starts out with a fake Drake song. And the next thing you know, humans enslavement. Yeah, yeah. By robots. It's a lot yeah. more than just a weird ass uh, AI interpretation of a pizza party that freaks you out with like, you know, the hand has nine fingers. There's there's lots of stuff going on, but we don't want to get into that. We want to talk no. about uh, about fun stuff. And we are thankful that you are here with us on the podcast and we really, really appreciate all your support. So thank you so much. So a big shout out to my co-host, Ryan Stick. Thank you always for being on this journey with us. And thanks again to our uh, producer, Julia Kajerski, who you can see right there behind me opening the fridge. And she just gave us the finger. She nice. She does not like to be on camera. If I move my, uh, she is gone. There she is. <laughs> it's like, it's like capturing shots of Bigfoot in the wild. Does she exist? There, there she is. And hey, she's got the Rockman Power Hour shirt on. Look at her. If Bigfoot was pretty and Polish, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, thanks to all of you for joining in. And we'll see you next time on the Rockman Power Hour. <laughs>